happy on pay. Here we are in the uh, the old studio, and uh, we're talking about uh, the music business and the music industry in Portland, Oregon, in 1979, 1980, 1978. And today, I'm going to talk about getting my first record contract with Matchbox Records, and it was, uh, you know, like most independent labels. It was a, one of the very first independent labels, the only the first one, I think, in Portland, but it wasn't uh, designed by a guy in Portland. The guy who was called in to help uh, Mr. Conroy, who actually started the label, was Andy McKay. And Andy was, he was JFK's publicist at Salters and Roskins in New York. And, uh, well, until he got assassinated. And uh, then he didn't have a job, so he got a job in uh, CBS, Columbia Records, as the head of publicity. And Andy grew up in Manhattan, New York, and he knew all these guys that I was big fans of, like the Ramones, and he knew Boy Chacult, and he's good friends with Sandy Perlman, Boy Chacult's producer, and he just knew everyone. He did publicity uh, for everyone on CBS or Columbia in the 70s, and he, uh, he was there from 63 to 70, whenever Arista... When Clive Davis left CBS, he started a new label, and he asked Andy to come along and help out as publicity manager. And that's when he did that. But he told me, in fact, I'll, I'll do this quick, but uh, on my birthday in the studio, Andy was a producer. And I, I think that Rob Sample would have gotten a better sound, but Andy insisted on producing everything. And so um, that magic of Rob Sample was lost, but I gained a whole lot of insight and a whole education on publicity from this guy. Barry Manilow, uh, it was, um, Andy's birthday <clears throat> is a couple days before mine. It's 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 funny that Mike Varney's birthday is, is a couple days before mine also. So the guys I've done records with, and Rob Sample's birthday is my birthday. <laughs> it's amazing. It's this, this team of scorpions. <laughs> so the phone rings, and somebody had gotten Andy. Uh, he had, they made a throne of Pepsi cans. Pepsi. He drank Pepsi all the time. And so when he showed up at the studio, I think it might have been Stefan, the uh, engineer, we recorded in this house studio up by Porta Community College, Sylvania. Little did I realize I would be passing the house every day for 20 years when I started working there. In fact, I got hired uh, 20... What, 23, on 9-11, yeah. My girlfriend worked there, and she said, and I was working in the movies, and stagehand work, and it was real spotty, and I got in late to the union, so I was low, and uh, they had priced the movies out of Portland for a while. It was the best money I'd ever made. I couldn't believe how much money I made per day making on the movie crews, but she, I was... I get this call in the morning, which she never, never did. She said, there's a job opening. It'd be perfect for you to get in here. And I went to school at Porter Community College, so did she. And she, she worked at the IT department at that time. And she said, come in, see this guy. It'll be a perfect job for you. I said, what do you do? She said, well, you won't be supervised all day. You'll be walking around outside. You'll get to tell all the cute girls how to get to classes because you know the campus. And I said, what's the job? And she said, you walk around. And later on, she told me, oh, it's 
ticket writing. So I was like a parking enforcement officer with the parking and uh, public safety departments. I said, I can do that, no problem. And it was a great job. But uh, that's what 9-11 means to me. And, uh, and also it means no more drug smuggling by intercontinental drug smuggling, I should say, by commercial airliner. Because people would get on commercial flights with a satchel and have like two kilos of cocaine in the bag and fly to wherever they sell it and uh, come back with the money. Nobody looked in the bag. Every other country had searches. Where the the U.S. is the last place that ever did that, and people would talk, boast about I took all this counterfeit money to Germany, and nobody checked. They don't check when you're coming in. It's only when you're leaving. And uh, anyway, so that's what 9/11 uh, means to me. And I went in. They hired me, no problem. So that's what day it is today. So let's get back to the Penetrators. That's what the band was called. After Rude Awakening, after playing for, I don't know, about a year, and I don't have any recordings, but I know we recorded with Rob Sample, and I can't find those. <clears throat> with Bill Melton and... Uh, Dave Phillips, and I think we had a keyboard player, Sue Cracksberger, and Richard Gates also. We played on KBU Radio on Johnny Night Train's show at 3 a.m. live. <laughs> so uh, after so many gigs, it just kind of fell apart. They went their way, and... Dave Seville, Dave Waddle, who is actually known as Vinny Swine. I think he goes by some other name now. Uh, our sound man said he should get him. I said, okay, and then get Brad Simpson, the drummer I played with Mike Landauer. And he played also on the first rendition of Married to Me on a demo with Mike Mick Zane from Malice. And we put a band together with us three and played shows. And I just then Jay moved Jay Reynolds from Malice, moved back to Portland, and it was kind of right around the time I got the record deal. So I asked him to join and be on the record, so we could have four people instead of three. So I get this call from Rob Sample, and he says, "I've got a, a record deal for you." And I said, "Oh, great!" And so. He worked it out with me and then said, you know, call this guy and go meet with him. And I met with him, and he lived down the street from the studio. And I where he was staying. He was, he was moving from New York to California to take over MCA's publicity department. And him and his wife, Rhea, and they just had a kid, and it was pretty cool. So I worked this deal, and I said, well, Rob Sample's going to be our producer. And he says, no, I'm going to produce it. And so we didn't use Full Color Woman or Change My Life, which I think are great songs, but I wrote, I had a whole bunch more. And I get the record deal, and I'm all excited. We got a record deal, man. We got a contract. We're, we're signed. And so... I had no idea what that actually entailed. So I would call Andy up and talk to him. He liked me. He was really, really cool. He was really keen on Chris Newman and his band. He really liked them a lot more. But uh, they didn't want to sign over the publishing. Everybody signs over the publishing, you know, 50%. Anyway, so they didn't do a record. So I'm saying, so we're going to go to the studio. Is there going to be a car coming to pick me up? And he laughed. And he said, what? I go, will a limo come to pick me up and take me to the studio? That's how naive I was. And he just said, no, kid. No, just drive to the studio. 
I said, oh, so are we going to get new guitars and new amps? He goes, no. We're just going to make a record. I thought when you got a record deal, <clears throat> they would shower you with equipment, give you rides everywhere. <laughs> so he had to hit me up on this, and uh, I learned real quick that no, everything a label does for you, you have to pay back from record royalties, from record sales. And once that is paid back at $1, your, call, your your take on an album is one dollar. Theirs is three. And once that whole bill is paid off, then you make one dollar. And he said, "You're not going to make any money off this." Oh, I thought it was going to be rich and get new gear, and the whole you know world is going to change and doors will open. And no, that's not the way it works. You pay for that. So uh, I was a little bit shattered, but I thought, well, it'll be a 12-inch vinyl record with my name on it, and let's do it. And, you know, I hung out with Andy this whole time we recorded and before. And we went to uh, Kenny G's manager's house because Kenny was on Arista. I was the only rock type act on the whole label. Michael Allen Harrison and his band Freeway was also on the label. And I, I think they used it when it, the Tower of Power horns section would be in the studio when I got there at night and met those guys, and it was pretty cool. But um, so we'd make the record. We finished it on my birthday. I turned 21. And the, I had a little party with the two roadies that we had and uh, the sound man, Richard Carter, and Biddy Swine and Brad and Jay and called up Katie McKernan and Madonna Doonan, two girls I went to high school with. Yeah, I really had, I was head over heels for Katie for a long time. But uh, we actually put her into one of the songs called Spend Me Like a, Spend Me Like a Dollar, where it's like set up in a bar. And a girl, Katie, is asking me to buy her a drink. And I get, towards the end of the song, it's like, what, it's about your turn to buy me a drink. <laughs> And uh, we wrapped the, the session up. We're done with the album. And it's my birthday. I'm 21 tomorrow. So we waited until midnight. We went to No Dogs Allowed, the club that I would go and help bands load into every week. And the club owner would let me, it was a tavern, he let me sit inside the door and watch the band. Well, we go to the the place. The other guys were old enough. And he said, no, but I can't let you in today. What? No, you have to come back tomorrow, Matt. <laughs> so I'm getting my, you know, reality check from all points here. <laughs> can't get into the bar. I don't get new equipment. Still got to play my same old Marshall and same old Ibanez, Iceman. One of the first. Actually, that was a great guy. I love that guitar. I played so many gigs with that guitar. And uh, I traded a Thunderbird bass that was owned by Julian Raymond. His name was Ray Molson. He was a bass player in the band Jet and uh, Movie Star. I think he was a singer by then. Yeah, because he got Pat. That The band that turned into Black and Blue. But Kevin Gron, Harley Gron, he uh, had this bass, and I had the Iceman, and he was a big Paul Stanley fan. No, he had the guitar. Jay bought me the bass. That's how it went. Jay bought me the Gibson Thunderbird bass with those small, single-coil, crappy pickups. It was a nice bass, really sweet. 
And Kevin had a Weissman. He had that made by the guys at Ibanez before there was a production model. It's just, you know, like in 1977 after Paul Stanley had one on Destroyer. And he said, I need it. I, I said, oh, I got a Thunderbird base. He's going to trade for an Iceman. I go, what's an Iceman? You know, like Paul Stanley. Oh, sure. So I took it to Joe Fazzolari's house and where they practiced and uh, on 50th and Division. No, 50th and Hawthorne. Oh, I met Ron Abel at that house also. <laughs> and Richard Carter, our sound man. And I traded him this bass for this guitar and uh, it changed my life I played so many gigs with that guitar finally the neck was wobbly and Jay was living here at the time and uh, he stepped on my cord and broke the ripped the, the jack out of the front of it and so I had, I had to put a piece of plastic on it and uh Finally, uh, when I was in Wild Dogs, I didn't need a guitar anymore because I was going to be a singer. And I was, I, I influenced a bunch of people to buy Ibanez Iceman. Kip Dorn bought one. He had the kind of the sliding pickup. And also Tom Roberts, and you might know him as Pig Champion from Poison Idea, bought one because he liked my guitar so much, except he cut his horn off. And, uh, he asked me what pickups to put in, and I said, DiMarzio, man. So that's all I used for years. And uh, I traded that guitar, the prototype Ibanez Iceman guitar, pre-production, traded that for an old 1973 Honda 504 motorcycle because I had no car, my car broke, and I needed a way to get around. I rode that until the wheels were square. I sold it for 50 bucks. But uh, the record came out, the Ravers, they had us change our name because he didn't think the Penetrators was a great name. I don't blame them. It was great for playing at the Met. <laughs> and, but uh, not for a record. So, and it was Andy's concept for to have me like a vampire on the cover with my guitar. And I remember taking the picture at uh, Mark, I can't remember his name. He was very famous in Portland. And there were, they had a studio on the, uh, Oh, God, right by this freeway off of Burnside. And so we went down there, and uh, they made me up, and they're quite, they're sweet on me. And treated me like a, a guy, and took the picture, and we went to a parking lot and did the back picture. The album comes out, <clears throat> and much to my surprise, it was... Pick of the week in Billboard, the same week Michael Jackson had a record coming out. <laughs> also, in CastBox, it was like the pick of the week. And I found out that Andy McKay has a lot to do with that because it really is who you know. And he had fixed it up so it would be spotlighted. And I got good reviews. And it wasn't that great a record. But um, I thought, okay, I'm going to have some hits. I go, so is this going to be played on the radio? And Andy's laughed at me again. Said, no, kid, we can't afford that because it costs a million dollars per song, per region of the country. There are five regions, and you paid, it was payola. And uh, then you paid the label back after it sold because it, record sales was big money back then, but it also got a lot of, it costs a bundle of money to get your song played on the air. And uh, in fact, if you ever saw the movie um, Wayne's World, the guy named Mr. Big, 
And the guy also, he played uh, Uncle Tootie in Goodfellas, Frank De DeLeo. Uh, he was one of the four guys that controlled the, all the airwaves. And those guys were mob guys. And uh, also, Frank was my, Michael Jackson's manager, his last manager. And that... Uh, I didn't realize what a big budget it took to get on the radio then. I was very naive, but I learned a lot from Andy McKay. I talked to him. We stayed friends forever. I would call him up. I call him. He, he became the vice president of the entire Universal Music Division. And he would do special projects like box sets. He told me, hey, kid. He'd always call me kids, He's like, you know, New York guy. New York, and grew up there forever, and uh, lived there forever. He said, I'm putting together the John Mellencamp box set, and it's going to debut at number four in Billboard, then move its way up to number three, and then go to number one in five weeks. I go, Wow. The record doesn't come out for six months, he says, after that. Oh, <laughs> so it's kind of a fixed game, you know. And he taught me, uh, he said, kid, we don't want another guy from Oregon crying about his dad on songs like Everclear is who he was referring to. He goes, you can do this. You can make your own label. And so I did and he hooked me up with uh, the manufacturer that did the records for Universal. So I got you'd have to get about 40,000 copies made to get the price I did, and it was awesome. So he helped me out. He said, Kid, if you sell enough, we'll be knocking at your door, and then you can owe us. <laughs> but, um, uh, it never happened. He just was a great guy, a great resource. And so I uh, would call up. Hi, it's Matt McCorp. Oh, yo, I'd like to talk to Andy. And I go, who's calling? I go, Matt McCorp. And go, oh, hi, Matt. And he just seemed to know me. And it was really, I felt great about that. And, uh, he later retired as a senior vice president in 2015 and then died, I think, in 2023 of cancer. So uh, 45 years ago is when it all happened, and uh, it changed my life. Man. After that, I, well, the drummer... With the record was released. I booked all these gigs. The drummer, Brad Simpson, shot somebody on a TriMet bus in Portland by Lloyd Center. So he was gonzo in jail. And Biddy Swine said, I'm done. He, I think he moved to Seattle. I had no band. And Mick Sang calls me up and says, Hey, Hawk, because my nickname was Hawk because I, I used to have super long hair and I got it burned off by a flash spot in 1976. My mom said, don't, don't, turn, don't blow this off in the basement. I go, it'll be okay. <laughs> I listened to her a lot more intensely after that one. Lost all the ha hair. My, I went from Greg Allman to Bernie Toppin, like, and boom. <laughs> It's weird watching fire come to your eyes. So Mick says, hey, Hawk, come over. We, we need a bass player. Danny Kirst was the bass player, but he quit. And they, they had this band called Academy with Pete Holmes on drums, who's from Black and Blue, and Michael Schenker. And, or you might have seen him in The Rat, because he played with The Rat for quite a while on the uh, commercials where there's rats in the basement and he's playing drums on that. It was with Michael Schenker a long time and Black and Blue, great drummer. 
And uh, these guys were all from the Andy Gilbert cover scene. You know, much better musicians than, than the punks and stuff. But he said, come over and, and you got you to play bass. Bring your bass. So I had this 1963 Fender jazz bass that I'd cut the horn off. That's why Tom Pegg cut the horn off his Iceman. And so I'm playing bass, and I was writing songs. They were into doing covers, but I talked them into doing some originals and singing, and nobody sang in the band. Jeff Horton was a guitar Jeff Mark was a guitar player. He didn't... We rehearsed at a modeling school in Hollywood, Portland. Hollywood, this northeast side. And there's all these beautiful girls in there when you go to practice, because we practice in the room in the basement. And uh, I didn't mind that a bit. So I talked him into doing some originals, and then I said, you know, I've got all these gigs coming up, but I can't do them. And would you guys learn some of my songs from this album, and we'll do the gigs. And... One was at the uh, Euphoria Tavern. A couple of them was. We played there twice. That's a, it was a gigantic place. Uh, that was the place that uh, was like the Starry Night or Roseland before that got converted. The Starry Night was a church. It was a big, they had a big Jesus Christ sign on, I mean, huge Jesus sign on the roof forever. So, talked him into doing this. We opened for Rail at uh, the Foghorn out on 102nd. And so I had some pretty good gigs. And uh, they liked playing with me. Jeff, Mike said, after the end of the summer, just kind of fizzled out. And so I thought, well, that was fun. And Jeff calls me up and says, hey, uh, would you like to record? I go, you sure. Okay, well, I've got, I go, but we got a bass player, so bring your, bring your guitar. <laughs> so, Danny Kurth is a bass player. <laughs> and Pete Holmes is a drummer, and I play guitar, and I didn't know Danny at all. He was all, they were always, always kind of the kind of guys who made fun of people, and so I just, didn't go into the house until Jeff got there. <laughs> and uh, that, that I remedied that quickly. So that's how Wild Dogs began. And uh, then Pete got an offer to join Black and Blue when Julie and Raymond moved to Hollywood. And he took over Hollywood Records and produced The Outfield and David Bowie. And then Danny says, wow, we don't have a drummer. I played drums because it was a great songwriting thing. You know, and, and we would record Jeff's girlfriend's sister was in a recording class at Recording Associates Studio. And they needed a guinea pig band for the students to uh, practice on. So we went there and recorded Fugitive of the Law. My song. I had so many songs that they just didn't have any right at the time. So we recorded that with Kip Dorn, also on guitar. I was like three guitar players. Pete Holmes on drums, Danny on bass, Jeff on guitar, me singing, and me on guitar too. And they liked us. They thought, you're great. Can you come back in three weeks? And we said, yeah. And so we... Went back down. It was like a songwriting club. We go to Danny's house like four times a week, and come up with great songs and really work them out. So all we had to do is just go record them. So the next time we recorded three songs with Pete on drums, and after that, he joined Black and Blue. And Danny said, "Well, I'll call Jamie, and because Jamie was a drummer, and he'd just become." the singer for Black and Blue. And they weren't Black and Blue yet, they're called Movie Star. So he came over, brought his nice, pristine Ludwig set, really nice drum set. 
and we wrote the five song demo and recorded that, the thing that got us a record deal with Mike Barney. We got Mike Barney interested by sending him the first, uh, first three song demo with Pete. And one song that Danny had, We Got the Power, Would Lead the Way. And, uh, or to, and tonight we'll rock. To, not the Tonight Show, tonight we rock. But Mike Barney liked the songs and he said, I see, I saw him. <laughs> this is funny. It's like so sitcom. I saw Mike Barney on MTV being interviewed by. J.J. Jackson, he said, if you've got a great guitar player, stay tuned and get a pen handy. I'm going to give you an address that you can send your tape to. This guy is looking for bands with great guitar players. It's Mike Barney. And so I got the pen and wrote down the address. We sent him a tape, and he liked it. Sent a, uh, sent us a letter, and a couple of days later, he wanted to hear more, and we are going to the studio in about a month, and so... We did, and we sent him that. And he liked it. He picked The Tonight Show for U.S. Metal 2. So we got picked for U.S. Metal Volume 2, and took it from there. That came out. In the meantime, Jay Reynolds was living at my house because he was putting together Malice, living right here in this basement. His bed was right there. And Kip called and said, you guys got to go see this drummer. I said, who? He goes, his name's Dean. And so he's playing in a band called The Enemy, who had just been on tour with Bluister Cult and Foghat. And I thought, wow, that's cool. He's 16. We go down, and Kip saw him the night before. He said, this guy's amazing. He's like Neil Peart, and he sings. So we're down there. When no other... Agenda like trying to hire him. Just want to go see this great drummer. We got to be friends, and Dean was really friendly and funny, and he liked this jacket I had, this leather jacket that had flies, <laughs> the gold flies. So I had a uh, an aunt that was a clothes designer in San Francisco with a, another lady named Sally Green, and they designed belts with all kinds of weird things on, and. Um, so, a couple of weeks later, Jay says, hey, let's go record those Malice songs. Dean's on. Dean, Dean will do it. Oh, okay. So, we went to Ace Tunnel Sound up here in Multnomah and did like a five-song demo with James Neal. And he was going to get a deal on Metal Blade Records for Metal Massacre number two. And so, we... Kip played lead guitar, I played bass, Jay played guitar, and, uh, James Neal played, he was sang. And at the Ravers record release, going back to the Ravers, Mick Zane came, and James Neal came, Paul Kearney came, and the band was there, and all the bands on the label, it was like a label release party. So there's all these guys in suits from... Arissa and the jazz guys. James uh, goes outside. He ended up taking a poop in the backyard and rolling in it, coming back in naked, and Mick didn't want to play with him. So to get him to agree to play with him, we made a demo, and Jay got a record deal signed up. And that's how they got Mark Bain, also the bass player for Malice. And they all agreed to move to L.A., and... I had no money to move anywhere. I've always been broke. <laughs> Story of my life. So, uh, Malice took Pete Lofman. We recorded a song for Pete Lofman a week later. And so, Pete Lofman decided he would be the drummer and move to L.A. And he was in a band called Fire Eye with Mark Bain. And yeah, Pete didn't actually work and work out, so he got dumped and uh, came back to Portland. Yeah, I ended up playing with Pete with a Wild Dogs trio 
1998. It's funny how it started. I uh, went to go see Bryce's band at the Paris Theater. And I'm walking in, and I see Pete. But well, I've always run into Pete here and there. And Kurt James had called me and said, hey, my mom's dying of cancer. And I'm coming to Portland because she lived in Vancouver. So uh, can we get together? And I go, sure. And I said, I thought, hey, let's play live on cable access. So I saw Pete. I go, hey, let's play live on cable access. And at the same gig, I saw Michael Brown, the guitar player, who was really good and played with me with Dr. Mastermind for a bit. And so I thought, I'll get his summer and we'll. We started hanging out later on. So we just, on the spur of the moment, just borrowed a Marshall from the monkey fur guitar player, Mike Ryder, the, the actual monkey guy. Yeah, he always wore a gorilla head. And uh, we played live on TV with the Clown Prince hosting. And uh, Pete said, hey, man. Let's get Michael and do it again. So I did. I hooked up a, another live show, and then we had a band that opened for Dawkin, Great White, Dio, Blois Occult, Thor. I think we had a gig with Armored Saint at Satyricon. And uh, it was a great band. Came up with some great songs. I haven't ever had a, a band that actually wrote songs like Wild Dogs besides the one with Pete. We, and we did like 28 of them. The, the album is called King of the World. It's really cheap on eBay. But um, that's uh, how the Ravers and the record deal came out and Andy McKay and Rob Sample and Stephen Phillips, the engineer. And uh, I'll talk to you next time. Thank you for listening.